tell me more about what exactly is China's modernization? What you saw there would help us to understand what exactly it is. Thank you very much. I was lucky to watch the modernization uh, close up uh, because I first visited China in 1981, which was just the start of the uh, fast growth period. We didn't know it then. Uh, and of course, I've come many times a year, most years ever since then. So from 1981 until today, I watched uh, in the uh, early 2000s, I was asked by the government officials also to look at the challenges of Western China. So, so I saw this firsthand. What I saw was a country that went from poverty to prosperity, poverty to wealth uh, in this 40 years. It is a most amazing story. Uh, it's a most amazing accomplishment. It is, I believe, also the guideposts for what will help Africa in its mm. next 40 year journey to accomplish uh, uh, a similar task, which is ending extreme poverty. I think that there are uh, three big challenges right now in the world uh, in which China is right at the center. The first is the ecological challenge. Uh, we know that we have to have a, a different kind of energy system, a different kind of industry, because uh, the kind that we have based on fossil fuels has led us to really the precipice of extreme, extreme environmental damage and danger. So transformation is number one. The second big issue is China, through the Belt and Road Initiative, has recognized quite deeply, and also through the Global Development Initiative recently, uh, that China's uh, future is inextricably linked with development throughout the world. This is right. Uh, China will be a major exporter to the developing countries. China will be a major provider of financing for those countries. China will be a major builder of the infrastructure throughout the world. So this is the second big challenge. And the third big challenge is, unfortunately, China's success triggered an adverse reaction in the United States. I think a completely wrong-headed and dangerous one. But uh, American strategists have come to see China as a threat to American primacy. Oh, well, I, I tell them, so what? This is not a matter of primacy. This is a matter of global well-being and global cooperation. Mm -hmm. Stop thinking in win-lose terms. But unfortunately, this relationship is now fraught with problems. And it is really important that the U.S. and China find a path to cooperation. Yes, uh, I think the, uh, the question uh, is, first of all, to move beyond the conventional measurements. So uh, I would like to know about uh, the clean air, the low carbon, the uh, longevity of healthy lives, and so forth. I think that this is what the common prosperity idea uh, in China is really about. And I think for all our economies, we're going to have to get past uh, some of our hangups with the current measurements, which have led us to a very dirty, uh, rather unequal uh, and uh, not so happy uh, quality of life. Let me just point out that in the United States, we get richer and richer and life expectancy continues to decline now. Uh, we're back to life expectancy of 25 years ago. This is dreadful. The population is sick. It's being poisoned by bad diets. Uh, it's, it's not being measured properly. So I would like to see all of our economies, but I, since China is so good at this, about thinking at its fut about the future, to think about what really matters for the quality of life, mm -hmm. for the distribution of the goods and services uh, that we need, yeah. for the protection of the environment. But also, I think it's inevitable China's so big and so influential in the world that China is going to be a leader globally of this new direction. That's a good thing. 
I think the Belt and Road Initiative, in my personal view, should be expanded. I know there's some skepticism, but it's a, it's a terrific initiative, and it should actually be expanded because we need to build out a high quality of life infrastructure for the 21st century, and I think the Belt and Road Initiative can really help to do that. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why this is so complicated is that we are at the end of the Western-led world economy, so we're really into something new, and that's also what Professor Singh was emphasizing. For 250 years, all the yardsticks came from Britain or the United States or the so-called Western world. That was always a historical anomaly because for almost all of human history, it's been India and China uh, and Asia that was the pace setter for Europe, not the other way around. And now we're in a in a very exciting world, I think, uh, dangerous, yes, but exciting in that we are no longer in a uh, Western-led world, we're in a multipolar world. And I was very happy to hear uh, Professor Singh talk about uh, this reaching for uh, the cultural base of well-being in different civilizations, because we're really seeing a lot of that discussion emerging. Of course, China has uh, announced, uh, and I think it's very exciting, a global civilizations initiative, and uh, President Xi has spoken about the need to uh, uh, look to uh, the the cultural history of China itself for China's strength. And I'm seeing that in, in India, of course, and other parts of the world. Now, put that together with the environmental challenges, with the inequalities, uh, with the rapid uh, changes of technology, especially the digital technologies, we're in a period of disruption. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to keep everything peaceful. This is the most important fact. The West, is, the United States, not such a peaceful country, unfortunately. It has to learn to be more peaceful, which is something that really is urgent right now. But we're in a period of change, and China's just going to play a huge role in that, and asking for a clear prediction can't be done in the same way as, say, 40 years ago it was catching up. This is not about catching up anymore. This is about figuring out a way to live well in the 21st century. Yeah. Greetings. I'm Jeff Sachs. I'm the president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network and co-chair of the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition. And it's a great pleasure and honor to join you today, albeit by video, but you can see I'm in a spectacular place in Western Saudi Arabia, uh, in uh, the Hejaz region in Al Ula. And uh, you can also see uh, it's very sunny and this is uh, a solar superpower. Uh, and uh, it's a fitting place for me to say a few words for this important session. I want to thank Guideco, uh, an organization that I admire tremendously for bringing us together and for the new report today on Pathways to 2030. And I want to thank all of the partner institutions, the UN regional agencies, OLADE, uh, and others for your leadership. We really have a team effort and we really need a team effort. I'm especially gratified that we are today with many regional organizations, uh, many of the UN regional bodies, uh, and also with GAICO, which is about energy interconnection. One of the lessons of renewable energy or zero carbon energy systems is that this must be done at a regional scale at a minimum. Of course, Guideco's vision is a globally interconnected energy system, and I hope we work towards that and achieve that. But at a minimum, we need regional integration. That's Olade's mission in Latin America. It is the mission of ECLAC or CEPAL. It is the mission of ESQUA for Western Asia, it is the mission of UNECE, it is the mission of ESCAP, it is the mission of UNECA, and it is completely 
a focus for Secretary General Guterres, as all of you know very, very well. The Council of Engineers of the Energy Transition, uh, which is a body of uh, wonderful engineers from around the world working together towards practical engineering solutions for deep decarbonization and net zero by 2050, met with Secretary General uh, just a couple of days ago. And Secretary General emphasized the need for regional solutions and called on to seat together with all of you, with the regional bodies, with the multilateral development banks, with GuideCo, with uh, Olade, with other partners to work on regional solutions in each of the main UN regional groupings for Latin America, for Africa, for Western Asia, for Europe, for the Asia Pacific. Please count on me, count on SDSN, count on SEAT, uh, the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition to partner with you. And let's make sure that we work together. GuideCo has given us some very important blueprints actually for every region of the world of what an interconnected zero carbon grid can look like. And we know that zero carbon electricity is at the core of decarbonization because not only does it clean the energy sector, the electricity sector itself, uh, it also enables zero emission transport. It enables zero emission buildings, both commercial and residential. Uh, it enables zero carbon hydrogen uh, produced through hydrolyzers using zero carbon electricity. And it enables zero carbon industry, whether directly through electrification or through hydrogen or similar fuel carriers that are themselves zero carbon. One of the points that we are working on very intensively at SDSN and SEAT is financing the pathways in each region. Without practical financing, we can make great plans, but we will not succeed. We know that if long-term low-cost finance is available, these zero-carbon solutions are actually at parity or even better than the fossil fuel solutions, but they are capital intensive. They require a tremendous amount of finance and the market-based financing is not adequate by itself. That's why Secretary General Guterres has called for an SDG stimulus. That's why almost every day I get to say what I'm about to say, and that is we need to scale up the multilateral development banks by factor five or more so that they're really doing their job. Because today, if you add up all the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and others, the total lending per year is only 100 to 150 billion. It should be at least half a trillion, but really uh, verging on a trillion dollars a year. This means a massive scale up. So let me conclude here by saying that with GuideCo, with the regional UN bodies, with the engineers, we can make the pathways to net zero by 2050. This is technologically feasible. It's economically feasible. It makes complete sense for the planet. It needs to be merged with practical financing and implementation plans. And I really hope that for each one of the UN regions for Latin America, West Africa, uh, Western Asia, Africa, uh, Europe, Asia and the Pacific, that we can make a practical plan of action, a pathway to 2050 together with the technological uh, paths and the financial paths and I know that GuideCo and the report today will give us crucial knowledge of how to do that. So let me close by thanking all of you. Uh, thanks to GuideCo for bringing us together. Thank you for the report today. And let us work as hard and, uh, and intensively as we can 
up to the G20 meeting in September, the UN uh, mid-SDG summit in September, and COP28 in the Emirates at the end of November and beginning December so that we really get in place these financed pathways to net zero by mid-century. Thank you so much.